Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Fantastic. So um, you're all welcome to the live Q&A, our second live Q&A for our journeys in entrepreneurship. I was really enjoying the, the, the song, the background song that was playing at the time. And just in case you don't know, that song was actually produced by two of our team members, uh, Tani and Sheni, uh, Olu, Tani Tolu and Sheni Oludipe. So it's such a shame to, to put down the volume. Uh, but we're looking forward to another exciting conversation today um, off of the heels of the launch of our journeys in entrepreneurship. Uh, my name is Adenike Adeyemi. I'm the Executive Director of Faith Foundation. And um, our live Q&A is the Q&A session that we have once we launch uh, each of the episodes of our Journeys in Entrepreneurship series. Journeys in Entrepreneurship is a podcast and vi video series which showcases stories of entrepreneurial growth um, and success and challenges um, in the Nigerian landscape. And the format we have chosen to explore is to have one entrepreneur interview another entrepreneur within the same space so that they really address the issues that they're facing, get to know, deep dive into their space, their industry, their journeys, and along the conversations, uh, showcase learnings and experiences um, across the way. We had a great launch last week. And today we have even an exciting one. And I'm really excited about this particular conversation um, because it also uh, it, it includes two Fate alumni members. Um, I've, I have probably listened to their live interview, which is on our YouTube page, um, about three times just between uh, the last uh, four hours since, since it's premiered. And I'm quite excited uh, to have them on a Q&A today. So without much ado, um, the sector and the industry that we're going to be talking about today is the creative space. And you all would agree with me that um, if you look at the creative space, I mean, from content creation to media, to photography, to film, um, to gaming, there's, there's so many diverse skills and talents that we're seeing, but also the growth of so many industries uh, within the space. And so for episode two, um, again, that is on our, on our YouTube page and across all our key social media platforms and podcast apps. Uh, we had Femi Odugemi and Umi, Umi Yakubu, and, we're, and um, the, the conversations really explored um, their journeys, particularly Femi Odugemi's journey um, over the course of, of, of the interview and the conversations. Um, as you all know, Femi Odugemi is, is the talent and the director and producer uh, behind so many brand names that we know, home names that we know, like Tinsel, Battleground. He recently also worked uh, on IREP Africa and is a household name, literally. Um, and then Umi Yakubu, I mean, I'm, I'm really amazed at our talent and our creativity. Umi's background is around game development and, and technology and, and has really evolved into also developing content and also producing and writing and editing. And one of some of our works include Silent Tears, Fourth Republic, and they really explored these conversations back and forth during the interview. So this really is our live Q&A that we also started because the world that we had at the time that we launched the, the interview or that we did the interview actually has significantly changed uh, from, from what it is now. And so we also had quite a lot of questions, some of which I'll be asking and some of which would also be taken live from people who had additional questions now, now given the space of the world uh, that we're in. So please join me in welcoming Femi Odubemi and Umi Yakubu to these conversations. And I'll be asking, uh, I'll also, I'll start by asking my own questions at first and then, um, and then also asking. So you're welcome, Femi. Thank you, Nike. Hi, Umi, how are you doing? Hi, Femi. Hi, thank you. Hi, yeah, hi Nike. <laughs> so I think the, the, the first thing was, I was thinking of when your interview was done. Your interview was actually done in August, August 2019, uh, which wow. literally is about 11 months ago. Uh, in fact, if I think of when the, when the team interviewed you, it seems like another lifetime ago. Wow. And so 
And then if you look at the last two, three months, a lot of things have also happened since then. So my, my first question to you both will be, um, how do you view the world now? Has your view of the world then and now changed? Um, what are some of the things that has even happened since we've done that interview? If you, if, you, if you care to share from a personal perspective, definitely from a business perspective, particularly in the context of COVID. Um, I, I would really like, that would be my first question to you. What has changed between then and now? And what's your, has your view changed, your perception of work, running a business, and then within the COVID crisis as we have now? Um, Omi, I'll start with you, please. Yes. Um, so, I think like, there's no way we would have um, even had some sort of clue where uh, we would be 11 months from then. Um, I think now one of the things that even from a personal perspective and also from a business perspective that we've come to the realization is it's, it's okay to not know. Because there, there, there's just been like week after week something new and different and things that, we would, that was not in the blueprint or was never something that you could have seen um, would pop up and it's the scramble to try to adjust to try to figure out and I think that's one of the first things even like I said from a personal level and just it's okay to not know mm. um, what to do I think the more important thing is what are you getting enough information and assimilating that and analyzing that and hopefully um, with time we'll be able to figure out some sort of path to move forward with that but I, I think for me the, the one that's one of the key takeaways from this crisis like it's, it's okay to not even know what, what you're doing or what, what's going to happen next because like like I said things just keep happening um, daily um, so it's it's hard to kind of make plans which is I think one of the I'm trying to imagine maybe during uh, 11 months ago when we're having conversation and we're saying okay it, there would be a situation where you don't have a plan that sounds ridiculous mm -hmm. for a business you know so that that would be the main takeaway for me I would say. Thank you, Umi. And I, I like the segue that, uh, that she has allowed me to not ask Femi, because I remember one of the comments that you made was that um, you like the ideation process, you know, and the ideation mm -hmm. process even helps to foster the design and the implementation of a project. So um, how has that shifted your approach, your thinking in a world where literally, like Umi said, is everything is changing by the day. You're looking at your numbers, your cash flow, and you don't even know. Even now, it seems there's a bit more clarity, but there's still a timelessness to the crisis. Mm -hmm. So uh, Fermi, it would be great to hear your, your perspective on, on that. You're on mute, please. In mute, uh-oh. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Adenike. I think the first thing um, really it, that we all learn from this crisis is, is to understand that there, there, there can actually be something so disruptive that everything that we know has to be put away and a mm. new way of, of, of working um, created. I, I think, you know, for me, for instance, what was really uh, a bit of a of a dislocation was that I was actually in the midst of making a TV series, Brethren, and we make this series daily. Hmm. And um, we were not quite to the end of it when this began. And uh, I, I, I honestly spent the first week or two just feeling sorry for myself, simply hmm. because it meant a huge um, loss in terms of you know what you had put into into the schedule and how the schedule was set, it meant uh, something that we had never thought about before. But for me, going to the idea space, what it also meant was that we needed to look where we were not looking before for ideas. We used to look internally to generate ideas through inspiration, and suddenly you have this situation that basically challenged everything that you thought was your process. And the solution to it was actually that the story that you needed to tell what came with the crisis. The crisis itself was the story. And because I, I was lucky to also had students in, a, in an academy mm -hmm. and I had to scramble to get the students back home um, before the lockdown, um, you know, one of the things we were saying to them is, can they make 
out of the lockdown, and it occurred to me that the very thing I was saying to beginners and young filmmakers who were just was the very things that I needed to learn, so learn. To, to actually embrace. Mm -hmm. um, that inside that 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 analysis was also an opportunity. The kind of stories that we can tell is a story that it is easy for the audience to embrace because they're actually living that story every day. Hmm. One thing that's very clear is that everybody arrived inside the, the vortex of this very scared, totally. Nobody had an answer, nobody. I mean, I still tell people, it's amazing to me with the numbers of churches and mosques and spiritual people we had in December, nobody saw this coming in March, which simply says to you, uh, that you know the, the ideation process, the creativity that becomes innovation, that becomes a product, that becomes you know um, something that you can sell, is not always um, well, deep in the recesses of your mind. Mm -hmm. It's also about observing your environment, um, reviewing trends, connecting dots. Uh, looking at the places where you need to dot the I's and cross the T's mm. and simply simplify um, your process mm. and, and maybe as well um, take yourself out of um, the center of your ideation process. You are not your ideation process. Inputs for your ideation process has come not from inside sometimes, but from the consumer, from the environment, from the prevailing realities from what's going on. And um, for me, I think it's been more to sit back and look at what's going on, look at what, where is the opportunity in all of this crisis. Mm. That, 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 I, I really like your perspective around that in terms of moving, removing yourself from the situation and the environment. And that even on that journey, once you got over the, the uncertainty and the, the, the chaos really, um, to now see that there was even an opportunity even on the path and on the journey that you're on. Uh, one of the things that I really liked in your interview, which for me, I felt that only very few shows do that, you know, and, and Tinsel particularly for me stood out with that is that when you look at a lot of other um, series or television shows from outside, maybe from America, for instance, when there are issues that are happening, they discuss them in the context of the stories. So for instance, if people were producing right now, or, or as you call it, I may not be using the right word, but if people were in production at, the right, at now, during the Black Lives Matter, every series would build a story around that. We saw that last year with the immigration issue and all of that. And I really liked that one of the things I enjoy about Tinsel is bring, bring it, being able to highlight those social issues and bringing them to the foreplay so that we as citizens or viewers look at this, but get a perspective while still being entertained with that. So my second question would, I'm starting with you, please, Femi, is now to say that as in, and following up to your comment that as we've seen the crisis evolve and you've even seen the, the stories, the, the changing and the different stories that are there, whether from a socioeconomic perspective, what do you think is the role of content creators like yourselves at a time like this, at a time where from individual's perspective, we're facing uncertainty, from business, there's uncertainty, health, infrastructure, all of that, and then also Nigeria in the global context. What do you think is the story of content creators at a time like this? And if you can even use some of your own personal examples or some insights that you think would also be important in answering that question. Well, I think one of the things that I, I said at an event last week um, was that what COVID-19 had done is begin to ask us to define what we do in the context of both being successful and significant. And it, it's interesting because it is, and it is uh, this magnitude brings, what I do is it's something that offers meaning mm. beyond making me wealthy or beyond uh, building my own uh, um, 
brand? Can I be the public intellectual? Can I be a philosopher? Can I begin to define this time in history um, in a way that allows people to draw insight because of what it is that they do? Um, how do they find insight? And, and this is very important. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're losing we're losing you a bit. The connection does not seem to be very clear. Sorry, twenty twenty. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we okay. can. But but it, it's breaking. But yeah, let's let's go on. If it goes on, I'll let you know again. It's, I think you need to sign out and sign in again. Okay. Please do, please do log out. Of what Zoom I'm trying to say log is, in again. this is actually a mind. time. Okay. Fantastic. Umi, while, Umi, please go ahead and, and answer while, while we wait so that we get a smooth connection. Yes. So I think the question was, uh, what is the role of content development? Yeah, now? so role of content, of content creators and storytelling. Mm -hmm at a time like this, at a time when people are looking for answers, where there are lots of questions, probably more questions than answers. And um, from, from the perspective of individuals as a country and all of that, what do you think your role is um, at, at this time? Um, I think for me, it's, it's um, highlighting that, and, and we see it in everything related to the COVID situation. Um, we see hashtags about, um, a better together or stuff around that um, th that phrasing and I think it needs to be beyond just a tagline in that so our roles as Femi rightfully said are not as clear-cut as it was mm. prior to that. so it is also an opportunity to explore and see where you can infuse humanities into whatever it is your technical profession is and I think for uh, uh, as a business, one of the things that we did is, okay, so we know that a lot of our operations have to shut down because a lot of our operations require grouping and an actual um, congregation. Like Femi said, you're in the middle of something and suddenly the next day you're not allowed to be less than six feet with, with somebody. So that shuts down everything. Um, so one of the things that we did was collaborate with, um, there's this um, nonprofit organization called Cyberlogic Foundation. Okay. So we, um, used our creative talent and worked with them to 3D print um, face shields. So this is one of the things that I think the fluidity of your uh, role is how can you use that, that, that togetherness that we keep talking about, like how, how can your, and I think I mentioned this in my previous interview, how can you transfer whatever skill that you have in a way that can contribute to whether it's the health or just the, the um, mental health or physical health or just contributing to, even if it's not the solution to the problem, but just managing around that. So that's one of the things I think, I don't think it's specific to content the edge of already being forced to think creatively about solutions. So we mm. do have that edge, but I think it, it translates across all fields. If this one path that you're used to isn't working, how can you translate what you know how to do in a way that benefits, whether it's your individual household or your region or your country or just globally. So like I said, as a business, we're 3D printing face shield with an organization that prior to this, we probably wouldn't have mm -hmm. collaborated with. Yeah. So that, that's, that's something that I think would be a way that people can think around their roles. Um, just allow it to be fluid in terms of what can work with you and just yeah, see where that goes. Thank you. And, and I remember that somebody was also talking about, um, so I think there was something I listened to a few weeks ago. And one of the things the person was saying was that um, if you think of a public health communication perspective, the advocacy that needs to go out to a lot of people that what they found, and it was a government official that was saying this, what they found was that they had to reach out to people who told stories, who developed content so that you could, if you wanted people to do behavioral changes, you could, they, they couldn't do that. Government could just say, okay, this is what we want people to do, but you needed people who this was their experience with that to be able to do that, that's number one. Then another person on the panel was now also talking about just even the importance of sharing the stories of the experiences and how people have navigated the crisis. So whether from somebody who has actually been diagnosed 
of the virus or somebody who has suffered a loss or somebody who is managing a business, that that important of sharing those stories, like you said, together we're one, we're facing this, this common thing uh, as, as, it, as it is, and we're having a shared ex experience, experience with that. So it's interesting that you talked about the 3D mask thing and the collaborations that are, that are also happening at, at, this, at this time. Um, and I will move to that. I will move from that straight while we wait for Femi to come back. I will move to that into one of the questions around technology. And one of the things I really, whenever I listen to you and you talk about your entrepreneurial journey and also on the interview, was how you've been able to marry um, like what people will think are different, different industries and find an alignment with that in the space. Now that we find that people are more FaceTiming, so people are more um, FaceTiming, not the app, but looking more at their screens, their phones, their tablets, and all of that. What are some of the trends that you've also seen from adaptation to digital technology within your space at this time? Um, and for other entrepreneurs like yourself, what are some of the trends or opportunities that you think that they should take advantage of? Um, I would say, what th th this whole situation I, I, in, in trying to find a silver lining um it's it's kind of accelerated the the rate of um, adaptation to technology within the country as a whole which is great um because digital technology right now is the main interface for communication and for working and so on globally and i know that the uh, outside of just mobile phone, having a mobile phone, um, using it in that connectivity of, of whether it's internet or networking is a bit slower with us here in Nigeria. So it, mm -hmm. this situation has kind of accelerated that. And I think the opportunity there is to try and find ways that we can break down those barriers to allow more people have access to these um, digital technologies that allow that connectivity. Because whatever it is that you're doing, it, it can't be on, um, it can't be one-sided. It needs to, mm. between whether it's B2B, B2C or whatever, if you're using it digitally, both sides need to have access to that. So I think that there's that opportunity and how do you break down or how do you make the access much easier for people, for a wider range of people to have access to that cheaper, if and if it's, it's new forms, new ways. I think that's, that's a whole, if we're doing SWOT analysis of, of COVID, <laughs> that's one of the opportunities that I feel um, is really, really potent in that, um, like I said, because digital technology is really how we've we've come to work communicate, just just live there with there there has to be an aspect of digital technology in your life no matter how disconnected you are from the big city or whatever there is some aspect of that so it's inevitable that this is something that we need to integrate in what we're doing and like i said the situation is kind of just accelerated faster because i mean in our company we did have um, a, work, a remote working policy but it wasn't something that a lot of people took advantage of. Mm -hmm. So this was a situation where, I mean, we did have a policy, but nobody was using it. And now suddenly it's in the forefront yeah. of, of that. And you have, uh, we do have colleagues that find out that their company hasn't even considered that before. Mm -hmm. And then realizing that a lot of world vision of this is how the world has to be. You're beginning to see that it maybe, it, maybe it's not, maybe you're spending much more money on something when you didn't need to. So, and then the convenience of people that, um, commuting was a lot difficult and whatnot. They can work from home now, which cuts back on commuting time, which increases productivity. So there, there are all these opportunities in having to, forcing people to think outside the box of what we're used to, because we are used to a very rigid traditional system of how work is. And you do find outliers here and there, but this was kind of, like I said, collective forcing you to think outside the box. And I think so far there has been positive um, evaluations of that. On the downside, you will find that some roles start looking absolute. Like some mm. roles might might drop out, of, but then again, with every role that's dropped out, there's new jobs that are being created based off what how we've advanced. Yeah. So it's kind of a give and take uh, situation. But there are a lot of opportunities, I would say. Fantastic, thank you, Femi. You're welcome back. Umi was talking about the challenges of our internet connection, and uh, that was a live <laughs> that was a live example right there. So please, um, in terms you were, if you could start again, please by uh, by responding to the question I asked in terms of the opportunities from a content creation storytelling at, at a time such like this across different demographics. You're on mute, please. Yes, 
Okay. Thank you. Glad to be back. One of the things I was going to uh, talk about was just that somehow we face now with um, with availability of a new strand of storytelling, mm. um, storytelling that is actually more exploratory of people's reaction to something so massive coming from you know the outside, and and for me that has really been. Um, a place to go, especially for our industry, where we seem to almost be in a cycle of telling the same story over and over again. So this opened up a new a new um, vista of, of storytelling that I think are more emotional, exploring more um, the, the psychological landscape of, of, of you know, uh, characters. But beyond that, there is a space here where suddenly we can co-curate. One of the things is this has done is, is made everybody suddenly um, a digital ninja. I mean, everybody, everything happens now online, regardless of who you are. You actually, there is a way in which the community um, of storytellers and, and audiences have become uh, not one where you curate and sell. It's sort of become one that is opportunity for co-curation. There is opportunity for you to actually access research to access feedback immediately. Um, towards uh, the end of Brethren, and we're going now towards the end of it, um, it was interesting to start reading people on Facebook, begin to give us um, new story angles, <laughs> beginning to tell us what they would do with a certain character or the other. And because they were now home, they could actually pay attention. And we discovered but quite frankly, um, a lot of the ideas were really good. And, and these were ideas that because we are in the midst of it, we might not have thought of it that way. We started to simply listen and embrace. And in the embracing of those stories, what you get the next day on Facebook is people saying, oh, I knew it, I knew it, I, I said that last week. And it sort of creates an online offline bond. Uh, between the storyteller and, and the audience. So I think that's really been, been um, an interesting so you're, you're involved uh, realization. involved the customer in the creation of the product? In that yes, the whole process of, the of creating yeah. uh -huh. is becoming something that you can't just do alone. Yeah. You now sort of have a situation where you can get feedback immediately. You, don't need you can actually to decide which character to kill, which character yeah. to keep. So yeah. that to me has been um, something very interesting and new. But the other thing is that we now have a, a situation where we have to figure out a way to shoot drama or to tell stories without everybody being on set. Hmm. It's sort of redefining everything. Like Rumi said, um, there is a way in which you've got to figure out a, a, an efficient system that responds to your limitations. Um, which I think is really causing everyone, and this is a conversation that I think um, Nollywood and all our creative industries are, are having, is how do we do what we do, um, perhaps not in the way we did it, but in a way that is as efficient as we used to do it, uh, but we may be less resources, mm -hmm. maybe using technology as the bridge, and I think that's already beginning to happen. I, I spoke to one of the producers of Big Brother, and one of the things they were telling me is that they will not have more than six people on the technical side of things at any time. That to me, for instance, um, in a show that used to have hundreds of technical people behind, is interesting that they can find that a whole load of those guys could actually contribute without being um, physically present. So following up on that, I'll ask you a question that came up, that has come up on YouTube from Elzafan Limited. How will the eventual digital switch over in Nigeria change our content, broadcast and media space, especially for, for small media companies? Any way to prepare for it and maximize those opportunities? Well, it, it would, it would um, when we roll over, there's just going to be far many more channels. Um, it's a great, it profits the viewer because the viewer will have access to far many more channels. Those channels can then um, begin to specialize, can begin to deliver content that is specialized. 
um, right now, because when you get a license now, I mean, it's, it's so rare that you sort of try to um, satisfy all the strata of audience that you've got. You want to do sports, you want to do news, you want to do, but it, it, it might not, um, that would not be necessary because there will be, you know, uh, niche markets. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to decide if you are on the side of the content provider, you have to understand that this would represent for you an incredible opportunity mm -hmm. um, for you to create, not just for a limited number, not just for, you know, one big, um, but for everyone, because everyone is going to need content. Mm -hmm. And for me, if it's going to happen next year, you don't wait till next year before you decide. Um, how you are going to serve that market. Uh, you have to begin now to begin to say, um, in, what of, in which of these niche markets am I going to deliver content? What kind of content will I deliver? What is technology saying? What, what is coming back in terms of audience feedback? Our audience is very active. And so for us, technology is, is awesome. Uh, in, in being able to open up these spaces for us to have conversations. So you have to design programs and, and stuff that go around that, you know, sort of take advantage of that. We also have a, a, a lot of large black holes in our programming. Educational programming is, is a huge black hole. Um, there, are, there are all kinds of niche programming, children's programming, um, that those who are in the business of content have to think about. Sports is going to become really big. Music is going to, I mean, these are, they call them uh, passion points. And, and a lot of the brands, and this is the advice I give to every young person, find what, what is a passion point that um, brands are willing to pay for. Because if the brand is, is, is embracing that passion point, it means that the programming and the consumers around there, you need to know what's their age range, what's their work range, what's their, where are they emotionally, what, what do they do, what do they like? Mm -hmm. And those are the programming that you need to do. Um, I've, I've spent all the time that I have with young people saying, don't make it about what you like because you mm -hmm. can't pay yourself for what you like and you're just one. Make it about finding out where is the largest swap of a swath of audience consumers, find someone that can pay, that's the brand. Because a brand has money it recycles back and it's got a budget, you know, for, for speaking with its consumers. You get into where you can be paid to do what you do and just connect to the passion of the consumer, connect to the brand, and then you'll be relevant when all these channels and all these platforms emerge. Thank, thank you for that. And I think that was one of the things that you both also emphasized during your interview that you cannot play in this space or even any space if you really do understand the value chain. Don't understand, if you, you need to understand the different users, the different customers, uh, the, the, and users and customers are who is using for this thing, but who is paying for other people to view this mm -hmm. content understand where the supply and demand is so and there's a whole long value chain across that people just see the end points um and not understand that there are different segments for 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 that so thank you one of the questions that have also come up particularly at this time is around funding and there's a question from an a at ame that's not me by the way uh from youtube uh saying that what are the typical challenges you face when raising funding for your business projects um so and then uh there's in bracket investor awareness specificity on expected returns and the usual go-to sources so i guess the question really is how do you raise funds and what do you need to know uh how and where do you raise funds from and what and where do you need to 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 know ab about this and and uh, i'll start with you femi and then to Kumi. I would have rather Umi was answering that and I'll tell you why. Um, I'm now, I'm at a different place in my career in terms of the fact that I have been blessed to have done, to have run my, my platforms for a while. I have um, been able to create things that have also provided finances for next projects. Mm -hmm. Provided finances for next projects. My uh, 
and create a, you know, a functional um, value chain within my company to ensure that we continue to focus on quality control, we we'll continue to serve our, our customers, a primary customer, um, either the channel or, 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 or the viewer, um, satisfactorily, we continue to be disruptive in the platforms that, you know, and the stories that we tell. So in terms of how I fund what I do, I may not necessarily be able to uh, give you my model because if you're starting, you need what I would call, you know, lift off um, um, funding. Now, there are two ways people are doing it. People do that through, you know, uh, investor, angel investors and all of that. And then, you know, for me, the danger usually, or, or when I speak to young people who are asking me about that, is you have to have an investor who understands your business, not mm. just who wants a profit. Because mm. there are many things in the creative sphere where your estimation of what will happen is not even close to what eventually happens. And there's a lot of people in big holes because they've got an impatient investor who is waving their business plan in their face because they put dates on it and he doesn't understand why they are now at the cinema and suddenly nobody's going. Um, the, 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 a creative product is not limited to a particular time. It's a lifetime product. There are many platforms mm -hmm. on which you can. Um, there are many, I mean, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a family in Hong Kong whose who, who's, um, um, father made like over 100 films that were totally dis described as rubbish. And, and after he died, the, the kids sold the same catalog for a billion dollars wow. simply because a platform from the US needed to have a Far East content. And content. their content became instant win and they got a billion dollars out of it. That was long after the man had died. So there, there is a way in which the, long, the, the, the lifespan of the investment in the creative industry is not quite a quick turnaround. And unless the investor knows that, you will have trouble. Uh, but I do think there are many places now where there's opportunity. Bank of Industry is giving young people, uh, you know, opportunity to access loans for content. Um, the Central Bank is offering loans at, you know, single digit um, interest rate. Um, I think it's just important that you're not just um, taking people's money for something that you are singularly passionate about. You, you have to have research that backs this as something that will sell. And if possible, if you could get pre-sales, as in platforms that actually agree with you, that when you finish with it, if it's at the right quality and, and the right technical you know, um, um, configuration, they will pay you this much for it, then you can't begin to actually say, this is the kind of returns I will get. And you can put the things down into numbers. Mm. Um, what young people must run away from doing is not um, paying attention to numbers. Mm. Um, and, and basically that's why I went to Faith Foundation. <laughs> Thank you. So Umi, have you raised money? How have you financed your, the growth of your business to date? Um, I feel like Femi is kind of covered available um, channels of doing that. Um, the only one that I would say to add is, um, so we kind of have this general thing of um, as long as the destination is the same, it's okay if the journey changes kind of thing. So we're also on conventional um, avenues, especially for the entertainment industry. Um, case in point, the, our film Fourth Republic was um, part funded by MacArthur Foundation mm. and the Open Society Initiative for West Africa. These are non-for-profit organizations. Um, so the, 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 they, would, they would seem to be at the top of the list if you're looking at development field, not necessarily mm. in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. So it's more of we're open to wherever it is that you can find, because Femi made a good point in that if even outside of just being investors, if whoever is contributing or funding does not understand 
either the, the process or the work itself, it is much harder to get them to invest, whether it's financially or if it's through resources. And that leads me to my second point. Sometimes your investors, in quote, don't necessarily have to be in terms of finances. Mm. It could be a situation where both of you are trading resources. It could be a situation where they put in money and the deliverable or whatever their um, returns is, is not financial. Is that you're going to do another project or you're going to do something. That, mm. And especially, like I said, for us that are a bit creative, we have creative solutions to certain things. So if there is that, um, we kind of have to go, we have to kind of widen our, our horizon outside of just the things that we're used to. And you think of financial, um, when you think of funding, it's usually loans and investors and whatnot. You, you kind of need to, because again, our industry is kind of very young. Um, as, as old as it is to us, it is kind of very young mm -hmm. for comparing it globally. So there is no set structure that people that are just coming in know, okay, this is where to tie into. There are things that people have tried and have worked, but that doesn't necessarily mean like five years from now, it's still going to work. Oh, so one of the things that I would say is just be open to other um, funding opportunities, even if it's not finances or just resource sharing, resource swapping, um, even if it's between two media organizations that are doing something very different. Again, I still come back to transferable skills. It could be something that doesn't have to do with what they're doing, but we can lend in our creative solution to that as their return. So that's just something that I will add to what Femi has already said in terms of just being open to um, unusual um, forms of, of funding sources. Yeah, so thank, thank you for that. And I, I totally agree with you. There's so many new ways of financing or partnerships, uh, yeah. which is the word that I'll use uh, to, mm -hmm. to support your business. And because a lot of people are looking to invest in talent within the creative space, and a lot of, unfortunately, there are much more international development partners than local development partners. Uh, they mm -hmm. don't have fully the commercial mind of it. They have the social angle and lens for it. Mm -hmm. So they are much more patient with investing their capital because for them is that get the stories out uh, to change mindsets, to change behaviors. Mm -hmm. And then they're looking to finance that. I also like the example that you said in terms of looking at non-financial support. So how do you exchange skills rather than financially and everything? Mm -hmm. And I like Femi's emphasis again, that it's also around the numbers. You also have to think of this as a business perspective. You have to get familiar and understand the numbers. One of the things you said in your interview was sometimes you just go through that investor conversation just to get a sense of what people are looking at, uh, get a sense of view from how will a financing person look at this so that you can even identify some of the holes or challenges along the business model within the space. There's a question from um, Tai Omoaki Africana who says, how, I want to know how to make money from creative works like poetry, short stories and articles. How do I go about it? Any one of you. <laughs> Go ahead, Umi. <laughs> <laughs> Take a face foundation course. <laughs> yeah. she is, well, she's actually, she's, she's going through, I actually know the name because she's going through one of our incubator programs. Uh, so you're on the right path. <laughs> That's basically it. it. It is a hard question to answer because there is really no one way. And the examples that you're that, that has been given in terms of poetry and short stories, there are people that are already doing that. Mm -hmm. So it can be one thing to explore what paths have already been taken and seeing if that works for you. Because sometimes, again, because art is subjective, not you can't just because one thing is selling this way doesn't mean some other um, genre or another type would sell the same way. So it, it would be interesting to kind of look at the existing um, people that are creating these things and making money from it. It would be good to see what ways are they following and then see how that works for you, whether it works for your own um, format or it works for your own budget or style or whatever. But it's a hard question to answer because I, I, I was speaking for myself, we're not in that um, area so I can't tell you this is what we've done this is what you shouldn't do and even if I told you that it might not work for you so it, it would be more interesting to kind of already see what's on ground and then that might give you a springboard to see what is possible based off what people are already doing or even help you identify gaps okay so if they're doing this why haven't they considered that so I think that would be the first place that I would suggest like go back to what's you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel just go and see what what is it there on ground at the moment and see what the future for your own um, formats would look like. Thank you, thank you. Femi, there's a question here that is directed as you, at you rather. As a content producer and entrepreneur, what will it take for a Nigerian owned company to be as big and domineering in Nigeria or West Africa, in the Nigerian and West African market, like multi-choice? What are we not doing? 
Ooh. Well, we need investment. Um, mm. We need investment that's not, um, that's not thinking small. And here's where it's, it's always at. I do truly honestly believe that, you know, when a government realizes the impact uh, of a particular sector and how far it can go, not just as a, as a, as a voice, you know, for a culture, but also um, as, as a space for economic indices to, to go up, a space for employment, a space for building um, innovation and new things. And, you know, um, uh, bringing order to a particular uh, process. There are many things that a government can do to make the building of such an institution, even from a private sector, easier. And I think I say that to say, there is no company um, out of places like South Africa, England, or, or US that are dominating and strong um, across continents that did not require um, the support of their government hmm. in, a, in a massive way, a full cost kind of support that says, you know, and, and this is the sort of thing that I think the government of uh, President Obasanjo tried to do with companies like Transcom. You have to actually have a decided plan um, to do that. And you have to bring together your best minds hmm. to do that. It's in some form, a measure of economic diplomacy. Hmm. Um, it, it, it really is. It's possible for a single person to do it. I mean, obviously we have the global comms. We have the, um, you know, global comms taking over in as, as established a presence in many countries across Africa. But the quantum of investment and the quantum of opportunity um, and support that that sort of uh, plan and that sort of entity we need is beyond the smarts of a single person. Uh, there is no way that Angote is who he is if, if an Obasanjo administration did not decide that we are going to actually support, you know, enablers in the economic space who are working in the private sector. And the good thing is these guys have responded by simply bringing their genius um, and not wasting the opportunity. So we need that sort of, um, that sort of belief mm -hmm. in government mm -hmm. in our own, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, private institutions. And I think we will get it. I think there are conversations already ongoing. I don't think we need to be anti-multi-choice. We just need to be pro a Nigerian version of it. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you always need a model. You always need to know what the person you want to be like, how their journey went, or else you'll end up making all the kindergarten mistakes that they made. Hmm. And so if you've got someone doing what it is that you want to do, they're, they're being what you want to be, I think, you know, if we want to do that, we should be talking to the chairman at Globalcom to say hmm. what, have, what has been your challenges, how do we utilize your technology to create this thing that would become um, you know, an important institution for Nigeria. I think you know, it's definitely possible, but it's not possible, uh, it wouldn't be possible just with one man or you know, it's not from a creative perspective that you build such an institution. Okay, Th thank you. There's another question that, that came in just now, and um, it has to, and I want to bring it up from what you're just saying. Uh, is there a line you have to cross in terms of the types of advertisers you want to associate with your content or project or work? Um, if there is, how do you make those decisions? So I think essentially, um, if I were to interpret this question, is how do you make the decisions between whether it's people who are advertising or brands, how do you decide whether from an ethical point of view, value point of view, financial point of view, uh, who, who, who and who do you work with? And are there people who you would not work with or partner with? <laughs> well, I, I do believe that, you know, that it's, a, it's a trick question. Um, <laughs> it, and I, I call it a trick question because if, if you're really desperate and you've got a project that is in dire danger and you need a cash infusion, it becomes a much harder call, I have mm. to tell you. But I do think... Uh, one of the things that I've also learned also, you know, 
in terms of my collaboration with different entities like you know the the school of media and communication at um, an atlantic university is the importance of of ethics hmm. there has to be some things that you will not do for money hmm. I, I and i don't think you need to be at my age to make that decision everybody needs a moral compass you can see mine in my work um, I believe in law and order. It does not matter. I do not do stories where the criminal gets away and, 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 and you know, I will not do a story where, you know, someone steals money and doesn't get caught. I will not celebrate um, fraud. Those are personal lines that I also infuse into my work because your work expresses also um, a certain worldview that issue. Now, so when you translate that to the space of looking for money, I always prefer institutions to individuals, um, simply because institutions can suddenly um, have a bad day and um, call you in the middle of the night or, you know, suddenly change the terms upon which you have an agreement. Mm. I think institutions also work because you understand the paperwork and you understand um, the contract and the terms are very clear. Also institutions have the same ethical responsibilities that you may have and thus you may not have the dilemma of having to uh, decide whether you want to take Hush Poppy's money or not. Um, if that's the sort of dilemma you're talking about. There is no way to take a criminal's money and position yourself as someone of integrity, regardless of what the product you're creating is. And uh, I've, I've met a young man who also told me, what if nobody knew? Uh, that's also foolish because there will always be someone that knows and you know, as long as you know, um, your whole you know, castle of um, ethical you know, um, architecture collapses. So I, I it's a hard thing, but you do need ethical lines. You do need to be clear about what your company, your company needs a moral compass mm. and it needs to be articulated because if there is no moral compass, you're also employing people. Mm. There is a culture in every company and that culture flows from the top down mm. and, and good examples exist. You know, GTB is an incredible example. The reason a lot of people, um, you know, kept their money there was because you know, there was that perception of integrity and, and professionalism, and you have to foster that. It doesn't happen. You have to foster it, uh, and you have to sustain it, and sometimes it's not as, as, as easy as it sounds now. <laughs> Thank you. U Umi, what are the signposts for that guide your ethical considerations and, and how you approach, approach work, particularly as you're building your business? Um. So, I mean, I think Femi spoke about it on a personal um, angle. Um, and I think that that can also be infused in your work. If you know what your company's um, goals and company values are also very important. If you know what those are, you, you kind of always used to, you, you need to use that as guidelines towards whatever it is that you're doing. Because it could also be argued that um, as an individual, if I choose to work by my own ethics, that's quite subjective. Um, at any point I can decide to make concessions. So it is hard for you to ethics kind of maybe if it's if you're being hired as an individual, it's 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 fine. But as an organization or as an entity, you kind of need to have these ground rules that everybody, regardless of the mood or situation, have these guidelines guidelines that they work with. And as um, Sometimes it's some, you, you think some things are common sense until you find yourself in a situation that you're like, okay, we didn't actually have anything written for this. But based off what we have, what is the one that fits with the way that we want to go? Um, and I, I agree with him when he talks about it being a trick question in that there is no business decision that you're only looking at one lens, whether it's ethical or financial. It's usually a culminative factor of all of these things. Sometimes one takes more um, weight um, like he mentioned, if you're desperate, it's most likely financial factor that's going to take more weight. But at the end of the day, you need to use all of these lenses and follow your mm -hmm. guidelines to be able to sort of have some sort of credibility um, within your own um, creative space, and even within um, 
your your image as as a brand. Fantastic, thank you. So I, I I know we have about five more minutes left. Are there any projects that you have in the pipeline that you want to share or talk about? I mean, what should we be looking out for? Um, you've you've talked a bit about how there's been challenges, but then there's also been a lot of opportunities. So is there anything we should be looking out from from Zuri Twenty Four from Griot Studios? Um, please do share. I didn't hear the question at all. You oh, were... sorry. Umi, did you hear me? I didn't you hear in you. And out of it. Okay, sorry. So it's probably my connection. So I was saying that what, what, what are, are there any exciting projects that we should be looking out for from, from it, both of you over the next couple of months? Is there something in the pipeline that you would like to share? I think Femi's uh, screen is frozen a bit. Umi, please do right. Um, we, we are working on a, a, a documentary. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure how much of that I can talk about. <laughs> okay. we, are, we are working on a documentary um, called Up Never. It's looking at the power sector um, mm -hmm. in Nigeria. So that's something that's quite interesting and we're very excited about that. Um, and also uh, we have a mobile game in the works. It's works, cutting, which it's, is, um, it's breaking. I think Femi's just joined us. Can you, can, yeah. Hello. Hello, Femi. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think he'll join us back again. Please go ahead. Right. Yeah. I said uh, we have a documentary coming up as well as a mobile game that we're really excited about um, because this, where we're, we're trying something um, with um, user, fo user, user focus or user centered design. So these are projects that we've used that throughout, which is a new angle and type, kind of fits into what we're talking about in terms of consumers and, and clients um, contribution to projects itself so we're really excited about this so hopefully you guys will see that in a couple of months we, we, we look forward to that Femi any new projects you would like to to just give us a glimpse or, or share? well you know I, I never give glimpses because sometimes <laughs> I myself am not, I'm not so sure I, but right now we're working on um uh, we're very proud to to partner Daria Media, Kadaria, Kadria Med, yes. um, to be producing um, a, a COVID-19 uh, documentary. So we're very focused on that. We're very excited because we, we really um, think it's going to be a very impactful uh, kind of work. And we're very proud to work with uh, such a quality uh, brand and a quality person. Um, but beyond that, we, we all just finishing our current series, Brethren, and uh, we hope um, when we figured out how uh, making a, a TV drama daily would work post COVID, uh, we'll come up with, with some new things. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Um, there's a last question that just came in and I think that will be the final question. Uh, we, we have about two and a half more minutes. Um, somebody said, how do you draw the line between inspiration and what will become a viable business idea. So you have a baby, there's an idea you have. Um, how do you draw the line between that baby, that idea that you're thinking of? And then how do you know when to say no? That this baby is just a baby. It's not going to become a profitable business uh, um, uh, um, in the creative space. I, I think you've talked about it uh, in, bits and, in bits and pieces, but if, if we can just use that as a roundup question. Go ahead, Umi. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I, I I think I don't I, I think inspiration is always useful. Obviously, um, the self exploratory act. But even if um, you have an idea and you've fleshed it out, and it might not be viable for where you are as a business or for the resources that you have, or if sometimes even just the timing of it that is off, but I'm not, I, I don't think, at least we've not been in a situation where we say, okay, you, you, you discard that. And I think one of the things that we had talked about previously, and also in this is the, the whole ideation process, which this period gives us a time to actually really flesh out some of these inspirations or some of these ideas that we have. It's absolutely fine to work something to what we call like maybe the, the pitch deck, um, level where you can at any point bring it up and even if it's a treatment or something bring it up to show someone that this is the idea that you 
have, it's fine to get it up to that. And then it's okay to shelve it. There is always an opportunity where either that as is can come back and become viable. Like I said, it could be timing, it could be resources. It could just be at that moment, the market isn't ready. There's always an opportunity to bring that back or, it's, or even to build up of something that's existing. Because again, we're human beings. We have very, very unreliable memory. So you might have an idea and you decide, I'm not going to work on this. And then five years down the line, something very similar that requires that idea comes up and you don't have anything to show for it. Mm -hmm. And case the point, I would use the example of Fourth Republic. Fourth Republic treatment, which is the basic idea, had been around for, for more than, I think, three years. And it's just the opportunity that rose. And it was just go to the archives, bring it out and hit the ground running, as opposed to having to waste time trying to remember what exactly was that thing? Do you even remember the time that, exactly? So I, I wouldn't really say it's about drawing the line. It's the drawing the line would be more about, is this ready for the market at the moment? If mm. it's not, put it in your archives. I, I don't think any idea is useless. It, you might, it might not work as its own. It can be, it can be merged into something else. It can, it can evolve. Even you as a creative, you evolve and you grow and you can build up on it. But I wouldn't say you draw the line and say, okay, this is not going to be useful. It's more of, like I said, if you're doing your fact, if you're doing a cohesive um, analysis of, okay, is this viable right now, financially, ethically, all those other things. If the answer is no, then I wouldn't really say throw it away. I would say keep that and come mm. back to it another time. That's, that's probably my own um, suggestion. Fantastic. Thank you, that's a good one, thank you. I'll just close by saying I, I entirely agree with Mimi. And um, I wanna say thank you to Adeni Care for your leadership and, and for this sort of wonderful um, platform to have the community of Faith Foundation um, alumni and, and, and uh, you know, uh, that community to, to interact and, and offer this kind of uh, exchange. So thank you very much. And thank you for the privilege of being part of it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been, it's been an honor and, and a pleasure, really, honestly, uh, for this process. Um, uh, speaking of its foundation community, there's a last comment that I'll read out. Mr. Femi, I interned with you after my AAP class in 2009. You're such an inspiration. I am yet to start my media company, but I'll be back seeking another internship soon. Akiwande from AAP 28. Um, I, I have to say something. One, when you were giving your interview, one of the, you spoke about uh, Rotimi, Mr. Rotimi. Is that Rotimi or Yekomi? Oh, Yekomi, yes. <laughs> Yes. So, it's such a small world. Um, I'm on a board that wrote to me, come in cares. And we had had a conversation about, and I was inviting him to Faith Foundation. He said, no, I used to volunteer at Faith. That in fact, in my first class, I had Femi, I had Joke. So when, when I listened to your interview, I said, I'm sure this is the person. So I will put you in touch with him again. After, after I have been in touch with him. I, 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 I did not say his name correctly. Yes. And I want to fix that. He <laughs> was very quick. He is so important to uh, my, my, my capacity to uh, make it turn around and, and yeah. focus uh, properly. But so thank you to Mr. Rutimi. He would appreciate that. Time. Yes. Thank, thank you once again. Thank you, Umi. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Femi. It's such a pleasure. We look forward to- Thank you, guys. To, to, your, to, to over the next few weeks and months. And um, once again, thank you to everybody who sent in their questions, everybody who is watching live. Their pre-recorded interview is still live on our YouTube page and it's on all our social media platforms, Facebook Watch, Instagram TV, and all our podcast apps. Please join us next week, Friday, for the third episode that we'll be releasing soon. And until then, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.